Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this lecture, we're going to carry on towards showing that any quadrilateral is the perspective image of a square. This famous math problem is actually problem 72 of Heinrich Dory's classic book, 100 Great Problems of Elementary Mathematics, which is this thing right here, lovely textbook, okay? And uh, you can actually see on the cover, perhaps, this diagram here is actually taken from this very problem. We, however, are going to be following a slightly different tack. I'm going to be following a very nice paper called The Image of a Square, published 2017 in the American Mathematical Monthly by Cranell, France, and Futamara. And the subject, in some sense, goes back to Brooke Taylor of Taylor series fame, who in 1719 published a book called New Principles of Linear Perspective, where the uh, idea of projective geometry applied to this uh, general kind of situation was perhaps for the first time systematically developed. Now in our first video on this topic, we already introduced some important ideas from projective geometry. We're going to carry on uh, today with that, uh, introducing some more notions of projective geometry that are very useful, especially since these days projective geometry is sadly not taught as much as it should be. So we're going to be especially looking at perspective and some important uh, ideas concerned with that. And a good place to start is with the planar situation where we're just working in two dimensions and we are thinking about the perspective from a fixed point P between one line, say the object line sigma, and another line, say the image line pi. So what we're thinking about here is having some points lying on some image and we are looking at that and making a copy of it by drawing lines from P to the various corresponding points on sigma and seeing where those lines meet pi. So A corresponds to A prime, B corresponds to B prime, C corresponds to C prime. You can think about this as being a kind of a, a picture of sigma. Here is the plane of the picture. Now, in this situation, there's a few extra points which are very important. One of them is the axis point, where the object line and the image line actually meet. Another somewhat more subtle point is the vanishing point. And that's obtained by taking a line through P, which is parallel to the object line, namely that one there, and seeing where it meets the image line. So why is this a point important? Well, if we imagine looking from P at the various points on the object line, imagine what happens if this point moves, say, further and further away. Then the line joining P to it is going to become increasingly closer to being parallel to the original object line. So when we actually, in this parallel direction, of course, there's no meet of this line with this line because they're parallel. But if we just move a little bit down, then there's some distant point in that direction. And if we move just a little bit up, then there's actually some point in the opposite direction where they do meet. So this is uh, like a kind of a horizon uh, point, a sort of a vanishing point of this particular perspectivity. There's also a corresponding point down here where we take a line parallel to the image line through P, and that's uh, giving, say, a point Z. That point Z will have the property that it doesn't have a corresponding image on the image line because the line through it and P is parallel to pi, so it doesn't actually meet pi in a, in a finite point. Now, this uh, kind of uh, situation uh, is motivating the idea of adding points at infinity to lines, and that's what we do in projective geometry. So we want to augment our lines by adding one more point, which we consider to be at infinity, and then that allows two lines like this, which are parallel, to now meet at this further point at infinity that we've chosen in that direction. So when we do that, then we get a, a nice correspondence between the extended line, the projective line, consisting of the original line together with this sort of infinite point, and, uh, and the image line together augmented by another infinite point. 
Now, an attractive aspect of this subject is that it doesn't really depend on the points being in any particular configuration with respect to each other. So the same arguments and discussions will still be valid if we arrange things differently. So here is a variant, for example, where we have the object line sigma here and the image line pi there, and we're still projecting from this point p. So a gets sent to a prime, b gets sent to b prime, c gets sent to c prime. And if we move far, you know, in this direction or in this direction along the object line, then the image of the point will move towards this point. This is the vanishing point over here. Now here is another such situation where here's the uh, object line sigma, the image line pi. Now p is sort of in between them in some sense, but still it's the case that we can correspond a to a prime, b to b prime, c to c prime. So we still think about this as sort of a picture or image of the points here. In this case, the vanishing point will be this one here. Here's another situation where the two lines, sigma and pi, are actually parallel. So they don't actually meet at a finite point, but of course when we add a point at infinity, sort of like you think about that as some point sort of in that direction very, very high up there, then they do meet at that point at infinity and then there's still the correspondence works. So here say is a perspective point P, A, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime. We're still mapping points in the object line two points on the image line. Now there's a slight variation to this story where we consider a parallel projection rather than a perspective projection. So this is really when the point of perspectivity that we've been calling P is removed very far so it actually goes to infinity. Okay so for example suppose we have sigma here, pi here, and suppose this point P is moved and we send it to infinity in that direction. What that means? It means that the lines emanating from P are all to be thought of as being parallel. So all the lines emanating from P are all in this parallel direction. Okay. So now the correspondence between points is A goes to A prime, B goes to B prime, C goes to C prime. So this kind of parallel projection has some uh, important sort of additional properties. Namely, Equally spaced points go to equally spaced points. So if A, B, and C are equally spaced on the object line, and that means that this vector equals this vector, okay, then their image points, A prime, B prime, and C prime, will be equally spaced along the image line. This vector is the same as this vector, and so on. Note that this is not a metrical thing, so we don't need a notion of distance. In fact, it's important not to think about distance in this context. This is a question about vectors. So we're not really measuring the lengths of vectors. We're just saying that this vector, this separation, is the same as that separation there. Another important property, which is more apparent once we go to three dimensions, is that parallel lines go to parallel lines when you have a parallel projection. So when it comes to representing three-dimensional objects on a plane, then it's important to be aware of whether we're using a perspective projection, that is from a point, or one of these parallel projections where the point of perspectivity is actually at infinity. In artistic endeavors, with painters and such, generally a perspectivity is involved because we're thinking about looking at this like the way the eye looks at something, so there's actually a fixed point. But with a lot of mathematical diagrams, uh, the parallel projection is actually preferred. And it's important to distinguish between those two kinds of things and to be aware of whether we're looking at a parallel projection of something or a perspectivity of something. So a very important example is when we're representing three-dimensional linear algebraic ideas on a diagram. Here's the familiar x, y, and z axes, and we see sort of equally spaced uh, you know, coordinate points, one, two, three, minus one, minus two, minus three, on all three axes. And here's a little box that illustrates where the point, say, two, three, four would be. Two in the x direction, three in the y direction, four in the z direction. So this kind of picture, which is of course very familiar 
and it's the kind of thing I draw all the time in the linear algebraic course. It's really to be thought of as a parallel projection of a three-dimensional scene. So we can tell that because the points uh, that are equally spaced here are actually visibly equally spaced. And also because these lines here really are parallel. They're, they're parallel in the three-dimensional space and they're being represented in this two-dimensional diagram also by parallel lines. Okay. So, and that's a very attractive feature to a parallel projection, which makes a lot of things easier. Okay, so now we come to what we're really interested in, is three-dimensional perspectivities, and trying to understand what's really going on there. So we have the same basic objects. We have a point P in three-dimensional space, perhaps the I. We have an object plane consisting of something that we're interested in, maybe maybe Dory's book, okay, that's the object plane. We're looking at that book. And we have an image plane, say this one here, which you can think of as being, say, the painter's easel. Okay, so I'm a painter, I have my eye here, this is the canvas on which I'm going to draw, here is what I'm interested in drawing, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to connect points on the object plane, like A and B, with the eye, or the point of perspectivity P. I'm going to create these lines. And then I've got lines coming from my eye to various places on the book, and I'm going to see where those lines intersect or meet this image plane. I'm going to draw them there. That's how I'm going to draw the, the object in the image plane. So, for example, uh, you know, here is then the point A prime, here's the point uh, B prime that correspond to A and B in the image plane pi. So I want to explain this diagram, so it's very important uh, kind of thing, how we actually cook up something like this. Okay, it's, uh, there's some important uh, understanding to be had here. So first of all, let's just uh, clarify some terminology. So we have an object plane, we have an image plane, sigma and pi, and these two planes are meeting in a line, typically, that green one there, that's the axis line, let's say. Okay, so the axis line of the perspectivity. There's another important line that's around, which is the vanishing line. Okay, and what is that? Well, that's the meet of the image plane with uh, another plane through P, which is parallel to the object plane. Okay, so there's the object plane. There's a, another plane parallel to it through the the point of perspectivity, and where that meets the image plane is this line here, which is the vanishing line, also to be thought of as the horizon. Okay, so what's happening there? So we have our object plane, we have our image plane. If I consider a point on the object plane, as consider it moving far away, and I'm following it with my eye, okay, so I'm following it. As it's moving away, this pointer is getting closer and closer to being sort of parallel to the actual object plane, right? And if the point is very, very far away, I'm going to be pointing more or less at a direction which is parallel to it. Now, whether it's here or here or here depends on which direction in the object plane the point is moving. But there's a horizon that appears, okay? And the way to think about that horizon is it's a line in the image plane, okay, which is the meat of a uh, plane which is parallel to the object plane through my eye, okay? That's like a plane like this, okay? And it would meet the image plane in this line, and that would be my horizon. And if I was painting this scene here, and this book actually did extend, then the image of the, of the book on my scene would go up to the horizon and no further. Now, there's a complication here which I should mention that the artistic story that we're talking about, a painter painting a scene, it's a little bit different from the actual mathematics that's involved in the following way. That, technically speaking, this object plane doesn't just consist of a finite book. It actually extends in all directions. And in particular, it extends, say, behind me. So if I was being completely consistent and I wanted to represent this entire plane on the image plane, then if I was looking at some point behind me and joining that point with my eye and then extending it into the image plane, I would end up representing it with a point above the horizon. 
Now, for obvious reasons, painters do that because they're not interested in painting a picture where things behind them are also represented above the horizon. That would look very strange. Okay, but nevertheless, mathematically, that's a kind of a consistent mapping. Okay, so this, this mapping F sub P, this perspectivity from the object plane to the image plane, doesn't distinguish between things which are in front and which are behind. So just an important point to note. Now, there's a, an important question when I'm drawing something like this. How do I know how to put the A prime point right there and, and not somewhere else? Certainly it has to be on this black line. Where on this black line? So let's think about this line AB joining the points A and B. These are points on the object plane. So this is a line on the object plane. And let's think about its image in the image plane. What we're really doing then is taking the point P and connecting it to points A and B. That's actually deforming a, a plane. Okay, it's sort of a plane going down obliquely like this. Now that plane will meet the object plane in, well, in this line. And so in particular, it passes through this point here, the point where the line AB meets the axis line. What's special about this point is that since it's on the axis line, the perspectivity does not move it. So under the image of the perspectivity, this point is going to stay where it is. So that's the first thing to observe. The second thing to observe is what happens when we choose some point on this line and it goes far, far away. So we're following it as it marches off on this line AB, we're following it, and as we're following it, the line from our eye to the, the point is moving closer and closer to the horizon. And ultimately it is in the direction of the horizon and picks out a point on the horizon, which is the vanishing line. Now, how do we represent that? So you see I've represented it like this. Here's now a, a bit of a subtle point. So we have this three-dimensional situation which I'm describing in front of you, right? So there's this three-dimensional situation. There's my eye, P, there's the object plane, there's the image plane. It's three-dimensional situation I'm drawing here. And you are watching all of this, okay? This thing here is a representation of this three-dimensional scene. A natural question is, what kind of representation is it? Well, because I'm trying to explain what's going on, and I'm a mathematician, I'm going to use a parallel projection. So this is a parallel projection of this scene. So it's like, you know, you over there are looking at this, but I'm kind of imagining that you're very far away, so that all the lines emanating from you are basically you know, parallel. And the significance of that for us is that then lines which are parallel in reality will end up being represented by lines which are parallel on this page. So in particular, this line AB, which is on the object plane, and the line from P to the corresponding vanishing point on the horizon. Those lines are parallel in the three-dimensional space. And so their representations of them are going to be parallel on this page. That means I can create this point by taking this line here and just taking a parallel of it through P. So that's what I've done. I've taken this line here and on the page, on this two-dimensional page, and just moved it up parallel here and see where that meets this horizon or this vanishing line to get this second point. So what I'm doing to try to create the image of this line is I'm, I want to find the image of two points on it. The two points that I'm using are, first of all, this one, because it's fixed, and the other point is the point at infinity on this thing, because the point at infinity gets mapped to this point here. That then allows me to conclude that the image of the line AB is this line right here joining this point and this point. Once I have that, well then A prime is just going to be the meat of that with this black line here, and B prime is going to be the meat of that with uh, this line here. So please think about that uh, carefully. It's, it's quite tricky uh, in, in a way, okay? Um, 
So this is a, a way that I can sort of accurately position where this image should look like in this ultimately parallel projection of this three-dimensional scene which illustrates this perspectivity. So yes, it is a little bit subtle and you can maybe appreciate the kinds of things that Renaissance artists uh, have to struggle with. And even these days, if, you know, if you're a, a video game designer, you have, to, you have to understand this kind of thing. So let me try to solidify this understanding here by looking at a slightly more complicated situation where we have three points on the object plane. We have a triangle on the object plane and we want to sort of see where we should position the image of that triangle under this perspectivity uh, P. Okay. And here is the object plane, here is the image plane, here is the, here's the axis line where the two planes meet, and here is the vanishing line, which is the horizon. Okay, so what did we do just for A, B? Let me just iterate that. So here is A, B, and then it met it here. So I'm taking this line here and taking something parallel to it. Let's see if I do something like that. Okay, so there's a line parallel to it, let's say and seeing where it meets, okay? And then I'm going to join this point with this point up here. Okay, something like this. And that gives me then um, the points um, A and B. So A, A, will, A prime will be this point here, and uh, B prime will be this point here. Okay, maybe I'll do it in red. So there's A prime, and there's B prime. What about, uh, say, um, C, okay? So let's say we do the same thing with A and C. So we look at this line here, okay? And there's, um, there's that uh, point there. That's one of the points we need. And then we translate this thing. So it's parallel, something like this. We get some point maybe up here. And then I have to connect this one with this one, okay? So some line that goes up like this. And all the way up to there. And where it meets the black line, that should then be uh, the point C prime. Okay, so we get a rather a smallish little a triangle in here. Something like this. So the uh, red triangle there, its image under this perspectivity will be um, that triangle uh, there. Now, if everything is consistent, we should also be getting something else. So if we could also look at the line BC, which meets the axis there, and then the corresponding image up here will be, uh, say roughly about there, and I join these two. Okay, and then I, I should get again this point C um, prime consistently um, and also B prime also if I've done it correctly. Okay, so we get uh, this image like this. Now this is actually a, a, a famous a configuration. So if we look at this, what we have is a situation where we have two triangles, okay, um, which are perspective from this point P. And they are triangles in space, in the sense that these three lines emanating from P are not uh, all in a plane, three general directions like this. And we have one triangle ABC, which is the meat of these three with the plane sigma, and then another triangle A prime, B prime, C prime, which is the meat of those same three lines with this um, plane pi. And we see that corresponding uh, sides, the side A, B, and the side A prime, B prime, meet at that point there. The side A, C, and the side A prime, C prime, uh, meet at that point down there. And the side B, C, and the side B prime, C prime, meet at that point there. So corresponding sides are meeting along this line here. So this is a kind of a three-dimensional version of a very famous theorem, perhaps 
the most famous theorem in projective geometry, which is Desargues' theorem. But it's a three-dimensional version, and um, basically the theorem says that if you have two triangles which are perspective uh, from a point in, in three-dimensional space like this, then the corresponding uh, sides uh, meet on a line. And actually, uh, the reason for it here is almost you know, obvious, because the line that they meet at is just the meet of the two planes in which those two triangles are contained. So ABC is contained in the plane sigma, A prime B prime C prime contained in the plane pi, and we've said that those two planes meet in this axis line, and that's then the, uh, the sort of the line of perspectivity of these two triangles. But so, interestingly, this theorem is not primarily a theorem in three dimensions, it's actually a theorem in two dimensions. Okay, so here is Desargues theorem in the plane, which is the, the, the real Desargues theorem. It says that two triangles are perspective from a point, precisely when they are perspective from a line. What does that mean? So here's triangle ABC, here's triangle A prime, B prime, C prime. They are perspective from a point P, because A and A prime are lined up uh, with P, B and B prime are lined up with P, and C and C prime are lined up with P. And then the result is that if you take A, B and the corresponding A prime, B prime, they meet at a point. If you take B, C and B prime, C prime, they meet at a point. And if you take A, C and A prime, C prime, they meet at a point. And these three points that we're getting this way are themselves collinear. This is... Uh, very famous theorem. It's really the second um, important theorem in projective geometry. Historically, after Pappus's theorem, which is an ancient Greek theorem, this is sort of the first uh, modern theorem of um, projective geometry. Gerard Desargues, a Frenchman and engineer, lived from 1591 to 1661, who is really the father of projective geometry. A very innovative thinker, who uh, really created this uh, subject. And it's a bit unfortunate, really, because his story is that this subject was so novel and uh, original that his fellow mathematicians didn't appreciate it. And it unfortunately had to compete with uh, the new geometry of another Frenchman, René Descartes, who introduced sort of Cartesian geometry. And that became very important, you know, with, especially with the connections with calculus. So people all sort of went towards analytic geometry, Cartesian framework of uh, Descartes. And Desargues' work was largely kind of forgotten. Uh, a few people followed his footsteps, in particular Pascal. But uh, it was basically almost 200 years after Desargues that the subject was rediscovered and then there was a, a huge uh, amount of development in the late uh, 18th and the 19th centuries. But sort of historically, actually, Desarg uh, really stands sort of at the same level as Descartes. Uh, these were both really important innovations in, in geometry. And, uh, and projective geometry still um, needs some catching up, I think. Okay. So we've touched base with quite a few interesting ideas, especially having to do with perspectivity. So in our next lecture here, we'll we'll be able to uh, tackle uh, this famous math problem. Hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wildberger. Thanks for listening.